Welcome to the Dental Implant Practices Podcast, where each episode will explore how to integrate dental implants into your practice and into bone with your host, Dr. Philip Gordon. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Dental Implant Practices Podcast. I'm your host, Philip Gordon. Today's episode, I would like to share with you a recording of Dr. Jack Hahn giving a lecture at the first Dental Implant MBA conference last year in Irvine, California. He's an amazing implant dentist, a mentor of mine, and a great friend. I hope you enjoy it. I would also like to officially invite you to this year's Dental Implant MBA 2.0 conference in Irvine, California, October 3rd through 4th, 2019. This year's doctors will be myself, Philip Gordon from Dental Implant Practices, Dr. Ramsey Amen from Dental Implant Exchange, Danny Domain from Implants Black and White, and Mark Bashera, Canadian Implant Dentistry Network. The four doctors would like to cover all things full arch and digital implant dentistry and hope to see you there. You can register at Eventbrite or at dentalimplantpractices.com. Looking forward to connecting with you guys, networking, and learning a lot. We hope to see you there and enjoy the episode. <laughs> so, people that had an influence on me, that, uh, this is Lee Cal, putting his hand on my shoulder, that's Carl Nish when we were all younger, uh, that's me when I first started, um, notice uh, the jacket, it looks like I pulled somebody's drapes down and made a suit out of it, uh, the gentleman in the middle uh, was Dr. Feigl from Switzerland, I worked with him one week every three months for seven years until he passed away. He was like my father. Um, he was a perfectionist, and he said that the best isn't good enough. So he taught me to be, try to be as best I can. And like, I, like he mentioned, like Philip mentioned, every year we're doing something new. We want to do something different. Implant dentistry, there's more changes and advancements in implant dentistry than any field in medicine. It's not publicized because it's not political. It's not AIDS, it's not cancer. So the gentleman with his arm on my shoulder is Peter Worley. He's one of the top aesthetic dentists in the world. And uh, he's the one that taught us the first computer presentation. I'm not talking about Novo Guide or guided surgery or all of this which he does teach now, but he taught us about how to put pictures in and how to present. So I'm sitting next to Joe Vassas, and he's like me, about the same age, and uh, Peter's gone real fast with uh, the computer, and I said to Joe, you understand this? He goes, are you kidding? I just figured out how carbon paper works. <laughs> so anyhow, one of the biggest ob obstacles is cost to the patients. The people that need us the most are lower income people. You have to be honest. Look at your food service people. They're missing half their teeth. People working in McDonald's, Burger King, this and that. Higher educated people that have been taking care of their teeth have more teeth. So what we get from those patients is what I call the emergency implant, the broken root canal tooth. They call in the morning, I broke a front tooth. I gotta go to work, I gotta go to a party. What can you do? So that's, that's a big part of our market. So I also, I market that, and then we market the terminal teeth cases. And so it says, we need to save money, Joe. This is the year uh, we go to Cancun, do it now. So her husband's gonna never uh, know if we can. So this is uh, one of my favorite things to do when um, Philip was talking about profitability, when you do an immediate single tooth replacement, it doesn't take long. You can do it in less than an hour's time with a temporary and the patient goes out with what we call a wow effect. And they tell their people, their friends, people they work with, whatever. So that's what we do. We take a tooth out, we prepare the site and place an implant and then a crown will be placed on that. So you see the terminal tooth case. Look at her lower. Now this patient can't afford to do the lower yet, but she's so happy with what we did on the upper, she's saving her penny. She told me when I worked out, I said, you really have to get these teeth out. I actually almost walked out to the parking lot to her, because um, I said, you know, this is getting worse. She says, I'll be back. I gotta wait till after the first of the year. So 
That, that's how it is. It's, and marketing is the hardest thing we do. That's the, whenever we think we have the answer, it, does, it goes away. You gotta constantly be creative. And now, doing this work is the easiest thing. If you do it enough times, it's like turning your shoes. So these are the kind of cases we get. Uh, what are you gonna do with these patients? Are you gonna crown those teeth? By the time they spend the money to restore teeth like that, it's more than what the implant treatment would be. And the same here, we have a patient with advanced periodontal disease, three, uh, class three mobility. Um, so, and, and you know what, when I tell the patient, the teeth are finished. Um, they said, I know. Now, Turnow gave a lecture about immediate replacement or uh, to, to extract or not to extract. He said the only time he doesn't extract is the patient cries when he tells them they have to lose the tooth. So you can see uh, the principles are all the same. If we do one or if we do a hundred in the same patient. So when I designed the implant system that I'm using now, the Han system, I try to think of things that you and I do every day. Things that kind of piss you off. I design healing abutments to hold the tissue down. Most healing abutments, they're parallel walled. Um, so when you're suturing, you're trying to hold the tissue down. It's like putting a 10-legged cat in a bag. So we try to keep that so it stays down. I try to design the impression copings so they're deep grooves, definitive things, and I kept the connection generic so that uh, you can use the Noble prosthetics. Um, there's a few others, but we kept the conical connection. And um, um, again, I don't do any plastic hybrids anymore. Um, this was a nightmare. They break, the teeth break off. What are you gonna do? You have to do it over, you have to fix it. That takes time. So I charge the patient the same for the Bruxer as I did for acrylic. I didn't raise my fees. So Gail says, you're gonna lose money. I said, no, I'm not gonna have your repairs. I'm not gonna have this. I'm not gonna have a patient that's pissed off. And then uh, it's the same with a treatment plan for the upper, for six implants, but I only charge them for four. Because in the Facebook and everything they see, all on four, all on four. So they come in and ask for all on four. So I said, I'm gonna do all on four, but I'm gonna do six. So Gail says, again, you're gonna lose. I said, no, I'm not, because I'm not gonna have to deal with failure. And I don't care what Paolo Malo says, you put four in the upper, you lose one. He says, oh, they still work. You don't have to worry about it. Well, it's like a three-legged dog. So, <laughs> so, when Carl and I used to brainstorm a lot, I talked with him at the Mish Institute, and uh, so we talked about how to break down simple diagnosis of what you're going to do. So we look at what is the prosthesis? Is it fixed or removable? If it's removable, it's part tissue supported, so maybe we don't need as many implants. Okay, so we look at the quality of bone. Where is it? I do all on six on upper, all on four in the mandible. This is one of the strongest bones in the body, anterior mandible. Okay, the opposing dentition, what is it? Is it a denture? It's a denture, it moves. If it's fixed, it's rigid, then it's going to have more. It's like somebody holding you against the wall and punching you, punching you. What about the muscles? How strong is that patient? We, we don't think about it. You have a little old lady comes in, you tell her to close, she goes, you know, go close, and you're going like this, trying to get her to close. You got a big six foot six guy, you tell him to close, bam, your Venetian blinds are rattling. So you're thinking, <laughs> this is needs more implants. So I had one guy, I planned for six, I wound up putting 10 because he would, would look like an acromaglia. But sometimes little people, skinny, little people will, will fool you too. So this is what we call our pilot checklist. So when I'm talking to a patient, they're telling me what they want, I have their x-rays, I'm thinking this is what we need to think about. So what about the biggest cause of failure? One is occlusion. 
I spend more time on delivering the prosthesis than I did in the surgery. And the other is not enough implants for the desired prosthesis over life. So don't save compromised teeth. If I look at the cases that came back and bit me and bite me, was the cases I should have taken the tooth out instead of keeping it. Now I screw up, I gotta go in and do treatment. A lot of times, you know, all oh, the patients say, I'm not gonna pay for that. So, you know, it breaks down confidence and uh, you have to take care of these things. So periodontal, um, is there a, a third, more than a third bone loss? You know, you're gonna do periodontal treatment. Um, the endodontic situation, is it a tooth that has a post and very thin root? Caries, can it be restored or you have to do a lot and build up and this and that? What about crown lengthening? You know, one of the most successful courses in uh, continuing education, number one, crown lengthening. Crown lengthening courses are full. Now, the guy that sponsors a lot of those, that did a lot of them, Doug Prudlock, the Perio Institute, I used to teach the implant courses. He says, you know, folks, we're gonna do this course, but you gotta be thinking about an implant. Because when you do crown lengthening, you have to blend it from the teeth adjacent to it, and now you shorten the bone bed. Chances are it might be over the, in a premolar that's around the canal, so now you're closer to the canal. So then they have to do probably and maybe an endo and a crown. By the time they do all that, it's more than the cost of an implant. That's why I explain it to the patient. We can take it out, we have the bone height, we can place an implant, it's not gonna break, it's not gonna have a nerve, it's not gonna decay. We look at risk benefit. Now, two weeks ago, I get a letter from MetLife, and the letter is, Assuming I am a general dentist, I'm not a specialist, okay? So we compare your submissions for patient insurance, and you're number one in the country. They surveyed 28,000 dentists, and I'm number one, well, I feel pretty kind, nice about that. I never, that's the best award I ever won. They can't understand why a general dentist takes out so many teeth. Well, that's the whole letter. Well, what you need to know, well, they're telling me, they want to know. So that's what we see. That's, I hope that's four days a week on my, on my table. <laughs> so what about the single tooth, uh, what they call the emergency implant? The aesthetic demands, the social obligations, uh, work obligations, you do create the wow effect. How many patients are excited about a three-unit bridge? You do a three-unit bridge, they go home and say to their neighbor, hey, I had a three-unit bridge today. They're kind of mad they had to do it. But you do a single implant, they talk about it. They go, hey, look, Mabel, especially if their name is Mabel, I had a single tooth today. I had an implant here. There, I was missing a tooth. 65% of Americans are missing one or more teeth. That's been published, those things. 25% of over 65 are edentulous. This was published in the Wall Street Journal. Again, it's a practice builder because the patient they're telling that story to, I had this tooth replaced with an implant. Chances are the people they're talking to needs it. Well, who did that? Well, Dr. Hahn. Well, maybe I had to go see Dr. Hahn. So we look at the efficacy of doing this, the safety, whatever, and I'm not gonna go on with a whole bunch of studies, but it was 90, the average was 97.97% uh, success rates. So there was really a small difference between delayed and uh, doing it. So extract, clean and prepare the site, graft any fenestrations, insert the implant, uh, and that's where I got the idea of a tapered design. If you get your implant page, uh, glasses on, you'll see that cases come in like schools of fish. He said something that I experience all the time. You're gonna have highs and you're gonna have lows. You're gonna have a week where nothing happened. And then all of a sudden, they start coming in again. I just had that two weeks ago, where Gail says, we don't have any surgeries next week. So then, 
we had enough new patients and we had like 10 new patients and we had three that accept, which is normal. Uh, when you do marketing, especially external, if you get 10 people and you get two or three cases, that's good. Um, so anyhow, um, so one day I had four single anterior teeth, different, four different patients. Like I said, they come like schools of fish. So I was using at that time Stereos, which is a parallel wild implant. And uh, I found myself, because of the subnasal fossa, tilting the implant like this. So now I got an implant out like Cucoflane and Ollie sticking straight out. So now I've got to use a severely angled abutment to that. So I, I dream implants. So one night, one in the morning, I'm thinking about this. I jump up, my wife says, what's the matter? I said, nothing, nothing. I got this, I got an idea, I got a, so I went and took a piece of notebook paper. I drew a tapered implant. And I called up the president of at that time Stereos before it was acquired by Novo. I called Ken Dirienza. I said, Ken, I got an idea. It's going to make you a lot of money. He says, what? I said, a tapered implant that looks like a root of a tooth. He says, but it's liable to kill the sales of my other products. I said, well, what you'll more than make up won't matter. Believe me. No, we don't want to do it. So... This was in 1993. Finally, it came to market in 97, and it became number one in the world. Unfortunately, I didn't own it. I have the patent, but I don't know what they did. So we placed, uh, we want to achieve 35 to 45 stability. Then we placed a temporary abutment, we fabricated a temporary crown, adjusted at least out of occlusion and off uh, excursions, and you want to seat that temporary with a good cement. Now, all the things I talk about and tell you, you think it's because I'm smart? No, it's because all the bad things that can happen has happened. And we learn by experience. So, when to extract, when to graft. Um, if there's insufficient bone volume, say they lost the whole facial plate, then we can't get stability. Um, we're going to have to graft that side. And you have to explain it. So sometimes if we see that and the patient comes in on a Monday and we see that we suspect that, then we can have an emergency flipper by Thursday, something like that. So if there's infection, active infection, if there's pus, uh, you don't want to put the implant or graft material. The pH is too acidic. It'll eat the graft material up. So, we want to neutralize it. So we put the patient on antibiotics for three, four days, have them back, then you can do the procedure. Either go ahead and, and do everything, put the implant and graft at the same time if you can get stability. Uh, so um, we look at uh, immediate or um, delay. So. I'm, de I'm describing what I'm going to just show you in the pictures in an instant of time. But the main thing is, the biggest mistake beginners make in anterior implant placement is placing them too facial against a facial plate. My friend Jack Krauser, very honest in Palm Beach, he says, the facial plate is your fate. So if you're up against the facial plate, you're going to get an avascular necrosis. Bone gets its blood supply from two sources. One, periosteum, and the other is nutrient canals and medullary bone. Well, there is no medullary bone on that thin cortical plate. So we need to have a space where blood can come between it. So we want at least one to two millimeters of space. So if you look at a natural tooth, a natural tooth is up against the facial plate. Why does that work? Because the tooth has a periodontal membrane, and the periodontal membrane has microscopic blood supply. Now, if you look at the palatal portion, the palatal portion is thicker and usually denser. So you want to put that implant against the palatal bone. When I designed the Han implant, I designed the threads so it could bite into that, where replace was too, not aggressive enough. And those were the things that I wanted them to change. And they weren't interested to do that. So what we do, we tee this 
I teach this to beginners, to people who even do their first implant. They can do this and, and do it successfully. So we put the drill to the apex, we slide it two to three millimeters power ball and go through that. And that's how you're gonna finally wind up placing the implant away from the facial bone. And still get stability because you're getting it from the palomo and mesial distal wall. So what about guided? Well, Paul Schnittman sent me this. I said, Paul, the patient comes in, they got a broken tooth, they gotta do it right away. You don't have time to futz around with this. The, the, the best guide is the socket. The tooth socket is right there, you see it. So, root canal teeth. So I love endodontics, I really do. Uh, because endodontically treated teeth with post is pre-implant therapy. They're space maintainers for implants. <laughs> so now, and, and I saw your video, the teeth that we usually see are all rotten, so you can't get a forcep on it. So that, you know, so how do you extract it? Well, what I, well, I don't have a pointer here, but I go on the, stay on the root of the tooth and create a channel. I, um, is it working? Yeah, I create a channel. Stay on the root of the tooth between that and the alveolar bone so that we can take an elevator and get in there. That's a 700XXL bird. That's my favorite extracting instrument, 700XXL. You go around that rotten bird. You want to stay away from the alveolar bone because that's your bed. So we're gonna go and create that channel so we can fit an elevator and get in there because these teeth are kind of mushy. So these elevators, you can see here. Now we, this patient here, had no facial bone when we took it out. So we had to graft it. So there's another different elevators. There's an instrument company back there that has a sort of another. So there we grafted. This is another instrument I have. It's a poor person CT scan. I use that in a bone caliper. Um, so we can we need at least six millimeters mesial distal distance. You can see we have nice keratinized tissue and uh, so we can go in and uh, now we're placing the implant. We did this a number of years ago. This is a four year follow up. We see we have nice papilla and we see that this is in harmony with the adjacent tissue, with the adjacent cervicals and the adjacent teeth. So the worst thing you can have is no papilla and the margin up here. Now every patient, I, li I like these lectures to go, um, High lip line, medium lip line, low lip line, it's all BS. When, when you see a single tooth and give the patient a mirror, what do they do? Oh, what's, what's that black thing there? Well, you, you don't show that when you smile. Oh yeah, yeah, yes I do, uh, you're screwed. <laughs> <laughs> so now, there's other instruments to extract teeth. I use this just to loosen it. This can be a dangerous instrument because you can bust the whole buckle plate. You've got to keep this bumper against, firmly against the buckle wall. So a lot of times I'll take that 700XXL bird and go between the root and the alveolar bone and create that channel like, so when we grab this, like you're opening up a beer bottle, that you have a little, you lessen the resistance there. And just to get it enough to go, like that, and then you can take your regular forceps and get it out. So there's an example. Okay, so that's ideally what you want to create. You went in with your a two millimeter twist drill, uh, uh, palatal, this was the apex of one in palatal, and uh, you can see we want to preserve the papilla now. In the replace that didn't have an aggressive thread pattern we had to definitively thread form the part of the wall because this is something to consider. If you don't do that, the part of the wall will muscle the implant and walk it against the facial and you won't see it until it's too late. Now, what is an vascular necrosis? What happens is the gum and the bone recedes so that you have threads exposed, but the implant is integrated. Another principle of integration, when an implant is in a terrible position, it always integrates. <laughs>
So you can see in the final, we were able to then preserve everything and then to keep that gingival harmony. So these are just an example. Now, how do we make the temporary? So this patient came in, she's a pharmaceutical rep, and uh, she says, I need to call on doctors this afternoon. I can't go like this. So we told her what we could do, and uh, we put on uh, uh, an abutment. Um, we put a little bone if there's more than uh, two millimeters between the facial bone and the body of the implant. And uh, when, the other thing I do is I suture tight. I loosen around the circumference, and I suture tight mesial distal, and that enhances actually the pillow. So now I took the patient's crown that was broken. They came, ground the broken tooth out, and then relieve it, and then take some composite and lubricate the abutment and take it on and off, and then adjust it out of occlusion. So that's at 10 days of just a surgery removal. So here's a young girl that was in a bicycle accident, came in with her mom. Um, her mom was so upset because she said she took care of her and she was growing up, made sure her teeth were nice. So we followed the same principles, um, ceramic abutments. I'm gonna go pretty quick here. So that's, that's the end result. Again, uh, the mother was hugging me and uh, they were so happy. Actually, they, they took my wife and I out to dinner and I never got that from an amalgam, never. <laughs> So uh, anyhow, these cases kind of repeat themselves. You can see that. But the thing is, this is what you're trying to develop. And then in the Han implant, I developed the built-in platform shifting. Again, we can keep the pillow. And uh, you see a little blanching when we put this in. Turnout calls it the seven-minute seven minute blanch. And uh, after a while, then it goes away. So again, we try to design everything for accuracy. I use all closed tray impressions um, so that um, I want to develop the impression copings with deep vertical grooves and horizontal. So it actually pops into the impression and doesn't move. So that's what we're talking about, gingival harmony, so that the adjacent teeth will be on the same line as the implant. So these are the things I developed over the years. The first stereos had a four millimeter machine collar. Then we went to uh, a two millimeter. And then I developed these uh, blades, was mar uh, marketed by MITRE. I don't think they're on the market anymore. And then uh, I developed these for, at that time, stereos. This was a terrific blade. These, all of these we put in, everybody that I see that it's put these in, have nothing but raves about it. But the company says they're too expensive to make. And what it is, it looks like a root form with wings. So we could put some bone over it, and they develop replace, and then the osteotones to go with that. And we have the same with the hot implant. So here was the patent for the tapered implant. So when we look at natural teeth, um, they're not square. So. Again, I based it on a lot of years of experience, uh, placing over 6,000 replace, and uh, I placed over my time over 40,000, uh, probably more to date now, but uh, we estimate that's about it. Um, one of the big things that was a big help for us was that Carl Misch uh, endorsed the implant. I showed it to him uh, three years ago, um, I told him, tell me your opinion. If it, you tell me it's a piece of junk, you're not going to hurt my feelings. So he looked at it, played with it for 10 minutes. He looked up and he says, I like it. And I said, why? He kept the machine collar and I like the pitch of the threads. He says, I know you know nothing about biomechanics. He was an expert, but you designed this to support vertical load like I can't believe. So he says, in fact, we'll adopt that to teach at the Mish Institute. So anyhow, so we have a more aggressive thread pattern, increased primary stability, built-in platform switching. And uh, the surface, 
is nothing new. It's a blasted calcium phosphate, which has over 30 years clinical experience. And we kept the clinical connection compatible with other systems. So I'm, I'm going to go through this kind of quick here and commercial part of it. But what is the value of platform switching? It gives you more volume of tissue and more blood supply at the top. And that's what's important. And it, again, gives you a little more away from keeping the pressure at the crust. So again, when we look at healing, I like to see this bone at this area in here. So here's the case. Uh, my first stereos, four millimeter. Uh, I put these in in 1986, and then this x-ray was taken in June 2017. So you see, we were mixed. We were between blades and root forms, but look, he didn't lose any bone. Of course, we put a lot of implants in, but he had a lot of bone. But again, I'm a big proponent of the machine um, and that putting uh, coating at the top, because where we started to get problems with replace is when they put tyunite at the top. I told them not to do it because we were having trouble in posterior maxilla especially. So we're on a roughened surface, and that's that plastic calcium phosphate. I kept the kit similar to replace everything left to right and everything color-coded to keep it simple. So we have an implant for all clinical situations for narrow congenitally missing laterals, for immediate molar replacements. So here's a case. You can see how close this was here. This tapers to 2.2 millimeters. This is a 3.0 implant. And then here's the final restorations on those. So here's an immediate extraction on a molar. Here's the nerve. I went right into the interceptal uh, bone and uh, very nervous. As uh, he came in, there was no um, uh, time for planning. His time was um, very limited. When I show you who it is, you'll understand why. So we prepared uh, the interceptal <coughs> bone and uh, placed a seven diameter a by eight implant, and then grafted the mesial distal. And after uh, four months, we then did the transfer of the abutment, the flexor uh, crown, and then uh, we uh, restored it. And uh, the patient was Chris Collinsworth. He's the announcer for NBC uh, uh, Sunday Night Football. And I kept texting him. Uh, are you okay? Uh, how you doing? And uh, I was worried that can you imagine me giving this guy paresthesia? He's a, a national TV announcer. You know, good night to pass over. So he saw my wife in a, in a restaurant and uh, he said, you, your husband worries more about me than my mother. Well, he didn't know why. So then uh, we follow the same procedures uh, extracting the tooth, uh, taking the curette, dragging it against the facial wall, determining is there a fenestration, and then uh, we can put some graft material if we need to, uh, temporary abutment, and uh, <coughs> make it temporary. So here, uh, this is a wife of a dentist, and uh, she had a little, pretty good area in there, but we went in, we put a 16 millimeter, 3.5, uh, and then uh, put a temporary abutment and took her existing crown and uh, refined it with some composite and adjusted it out of occlusion. And then when she came back, we just took that temporary off, took a transfer, a ceramic abutment. Her husband said, it's a nice tooth she has. So then uh, a technician made and it wraps her crown. But these are just different examples. That all repeats itself. Now these patients that I'm showing here had previous implants. And patients that have had success with implants become implant happy. So they call Gail and they say, I broke another tooth, I need an implant. So she treatment plans it on the phone, tells them how much it is, and patient, they come in, it's, it's, it's a simple deal. So, 
again, here's, uh, here's Mark. Uh, he's had almost now total implants, but I used his previous crown as a temporary. This lady was going on a cruise the next day, broke a tooth, had, she had a ceramic crown. So, and when I came back from the cruise and then healed, we took a transfer and again made uh, things. These are just all simple, similar things. But you look at anatomy here. You can see this area here. You couldn't put a parallel wall in there. Now this lady is very social. She has parties, so we had to do it with a, a temporary. I took her a crown and made this temporary, and then afterwards we did the transfer. So here I'm going to give you a little tip. Maybe you can use it on Monday. Um, you see these teeth in your practice. So here's a case where I'm going to take it out. And this is before I had the seven millimeter implant. I'm going to take it out and they're all in pieces. So we're going to graft the site and then go back in five months and place a wider diameter of six. So again, um, about delayed placement. We already talked about that earlier. Now this is the material I use. I use mineralized cortical cancellous bone. I use, I don't use membranes. I'm not big on membranes. I take this, it's a collagen with the cortical, this combination impregnated into it. So we take it and put it in saline and I can squash it. So I put the particulate in and then I put this over as a membrane. And then it's, it's osteoinductive and it stays in place easier to handle. And again, it's not like putting a 10 legged cat in a bag. We don't have to tack. So I mix that up. Now, when we do an immediate and a molar, it's hard to get closure. You've got to make such a big incision. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's traumatic. So what I do is we put the graft material in, I either take one of those little sausages or just a piece of round collagen tape and cut a, a, like a bottle cap. So we go in and we loosen the tissue. We just loosen the tissue here just to get it around. So I put the graft in and then the bottle cap on top of it. And then I suture and distal and mesial and mesial and distal come back across. And now you create it like a sling to hold it down. So what happens is, in, within 24 hours, the uh, tissue starts to granulate right under the bottle cap, and it closes nicely. And it's not traumatic, it's simple to do, and it works. And uh, you know, it's saving, making all that long, big incision, reflecting big. So this is worth the, is this worth the trip. <laughs> so here we did that on this. You can see we went in with the graph material, put in a six, can uh, replace, and then uh, after that, the made a ceramic crown transfer. Okay, here's another one we grafted. This was split. If you have a patient that comes in with a vertical fracture, get it out right away. They lose bone overnight. So especially if it's a kid even, and they didn't break the front tooth, it's split, they want to get it out. So we went in, we grafted it with that material. After five months, we went back in. See? Um, when you look at uh, tissue, the bone sets the tone, but the tissue is the issue. So you want to have good keratinized. You want to have good keratinized tissue. And when you see that, you know it's healthy. When we go into hygiene and we see the gum is purple and red bleeding, you know there's bone loss. We take an X-ray, and sure enough, there's bone loss. When the patient comes in with tissue like that, you don't need to probe. Here's another use for guided drills. This is the Han guided drill out of the Han kit. Sometimes the teeth are longer and your handpiece, the head of the handpiece hits the adjacent teeth. So here's one. We had to take this out and graft it. So here we graft it. All we want to be sure is this bone. So that's the bone caliper. That's a, again, a poor person CT scan. So we take a needle, put it on the lingual, the needle on the buckle, and then it gives you a millimeter readout how wide the ridge is. So here we can go in 
Again, this patient's had a previous implant. You can see it's been in for a few years. Nice uh, bone adaptation. This is a machine collar, a two millimeter machine collar. Bone forms it. Yeah, it's formed for that because it has micropores, but it doesn't have a rough coating. So now you can see the advantage of a taper. We can go mesial to the anterior wall of the sinus. We use the guided drill so the handpiece wouldn't hit the adjacent teeth. Here's another one here that has a huge area, big area there. So we know it's something. So we're going to take it out and we uh, grafted it. And we went back in. That's real bone. That's real bone. When we grafted it, uh, we put the particulate and then sausage over it. And then uh, and see after healing. So that was real bone, and we're ready to take the final restoration and take it all the way through. Uh, here's another idea. Maybe you can take this home for Monday. I try to avoid as many releasing incision as possible. So I thought about this. So I made what I call the book approach, where I made just an incision and it would fill up and then come up an oblique, a 45 degree angle incision, either distal or mesial, and open it up like you turn a page of a book. So now we expose the defect. Now this lady came from Morgantown, West Virginia. Her daughter was getting married. She says, I gotta have a tooth. I said, doesn't look good from the x-ray. The gum is, is bad. I don't know if I can do an immediate. She says, no, you have to. So here I was able to get against the polyp of bone, a little bit mesial distal, but she had no facial bone. So I then I want to stay away from this an area right in here where it's real thin. So now I put the non-implant in. I was able to get 45 Newton stability because I put it against the pile of the wall and put it in the button on to, and prepared it. And now you can see on that incision that I just needed to suture one mesial, one distal, and this one lateral. So the graft is here. So I'm protecting the graft material from washing out and coming out. So I'm only dealing with one incision, actually. So here I took her existing crown, adjusted it, and cemented it on, and you can see this is looking good, and then that's after healing. So then afterwards, uh, I didn't do the final restoration, and my associate did then. So this was the metal abutment I put on the day I did it. So he takes it off. He took his impression. She decided she wanted the other teeth crown, and then made ceramic crowns. So she's happy. So these are just ideas. You have to be creative. That's the thing with implant dentistry. It allows you to be creative. So here you can see again, we can go apical to this. That's what I look at. Is there bone apical? The, the immediate implant should be two to three millimeters longer than the, the tooth that you're replacing. So now, if you perforate the buccal plate, don't go whoops. Whoops is not our vocabulary. Patient doesn't like to hear whoops or oh shit. <laughs> uh, but anyhow, so what we do is we can put our graft material in, and as we put the implant in, it's like pushing it through a porthole window. It seals it. So there again, we can see we did the uh, uh, book approach. There's one that had a really big defect, so we put this in and then the sausage over it. There's another one that insisted that we do an immediate. So I made the temporary the first day. It looked crappy. She was unhappy. I agreed. So she came back when we took the stitches out, and I made a new one, another one. And then we finally and finished it. And that's, if you remember, had a huge defect. Uh, another one that didn't have a lot of bone. Um, again, we can change crown root ratio. So here we're going to have to use uh, we do a, what we call a smile composure. This is made out of the uh, PMMA material. And then after we get what we like, then they can convert that to Bruxer. Make sure they have the right lip support. And uh, they didn't have much gain. Here's Tom. Tom's been a patient of mine for years. 
Uh, he broke a bunch of more teeth. Uh, he had a bridge, as you can see. Bridges have an average life of seven to nine years. And uh, so he came in. Uh, I did these uh, 26 years ago on him. And then I had some replace here, and now he has on. So he has everything. I made this at the chair. Uh, it's not beautiful, but it's functional. <laughs> so then when he comes healed, that's tough. I'm going to just go through this. Let me just run through this. Uh, maybe I'll show you another tip. When you put on your uh, transfers, you can have the patient close because you're going to have to have the screws to lingual so the screw holes aren't coming through. So you can check your angles when you put on the multi-unit abutments. So the laboratory can also show you that the screws are going to be lingual instead of coming through the facial. So these are the PMMAs where the patient can test drive. Now this is one reason we designed uh, these in for the healing abutments to come up like that. So I can take an immediate temporary denture and put a soft liner and then acts like O-rings to it when you suture. And then I, again, you can see how they uh, transfers with this on. So that's the team. This is uh, by my, my chair side. That's the patient, Mike, and uh, that's Gail. She's my treatment coordinator. She's been with me 32 years. She's been with me 41 years. So that's our team. And uh, he had advanced periodontal disease, and he's happy. He sent us a picture of him eating a taco. So the two implant solution, they should be right at the distal, the halo and the nose. Um, it's a good one to treat beginners. I know he wants me off of here, but uh, I don't get to see you again. And where are you going to go? So, and, um, so don't do this. I could have done a Bruxer hybrid, this and that, made my life complicated. You have to, if you're going to do a locator upper and you're going to cut the pallet, you've got to have the distal implants distal enough. Otherwise, when they go on protrusive, it'll tilt. It was just lodged. Now, we go back. We don't see these patients anymore. Right, Scott? We don't see these. Uh, years ago, these patients came in, atrophic. You could have 100 sets of dentures, and they can't wear a denture. So we were doing subs. For some reason, the patient today maybe thinks that's the best there is. So we get more of the terminal teeth cases. But these survived the test of time. It's a 38-year one, and it's a 35-year one. But I was one of the first to go over the external oblique. Even though Bob James claimed it, I was the first to go over that in the, uh, impression. So this just tells about why does the world need another implant? And uh, all the things that uh, Philip talked about, we incorporated into this. So it's associated with a laboratory that has the most experience in implant restorations. They get 500 cases a day. And again, we keep the costs down and make it more affordable for more patients. And that's the objective. You can see this is, everything I touch goes to Glidewell. These are my dead soldiers. These are cases in progress. So again, stay with one system. Simplify the place, Philip told you that. Uh, for a system that has uh, increased primary stability in all qualities of bone, simple to restore, and offers patient prosthetic options. It gives them teeth that look like teeth. So don't mix systems. <laughs> and uh, so that's Jim Gladwell, and uh, he's got the money. This is a study they did a two year retrospective study. This is not me. They, didn't, they wouldn't use me because they thought I would prejudice. But you can see the percentage and the very, very low bone loss was uh, um, less than 1%. So studies, as Brenna Mark would say, studies are made for marketing. They're also a value, uh, a, a, a way to evaluate the clinician. So I've been in six different studies myself. So I, I know that they're not always 100% uh, what they say they are. So we're in our fourth year anniversary. 
and they baked me a Han implant cake. So good judgment comes from experience, and experience, well, that comes from poor judgment. So that's basically how we learn. Success repeated itself, and failure repeated itself. Oh, I'm not going to do that again. So if you had a failure and you learned from it, it's not a failure. The learning experience. This is my marketing, our sign. Do what your sign says. So my sign, that's all I do. I don't want to see teeth. The only thing I do with teeth is put them in a waste can. So I want to market that. Every Sunday we run a strip ad. I change the pictures. Usually it's a horrendous before and a nice after. Second opinions, uh, talk about a little bit about experience. So the sun always will shine on the future of implant dentistry. And you have people like Philip. I'm confident it's only going to be better and better. I hope I can live long enough to see it all happen. So come to Cincinnati, come visit us. We have Cincinnati Reds. We're famous for five, Skyline Chili, Grater's Ice Cream. Here's my contact information. I have uh, dentists here, and so I communicate with text, as Philip knows, and email, and uh, if you want to check our website or Facebook page, that's it there. So I have dentists here. Somebody said, I told a guy, a friend of mine, I just got the most expensive hearing aids you can buy. He said, what kind is it? I said, 20 after 10. <laughs> okay, thanks. Thank you.